the world. <laughs> okay, so not seeing any viewers yet. We're here. We're live. How do we see them? I have a little count at the bottom of my screen of how many people are watching live. I'm going to tweet this a couple more times. I, yeah, I just sent a tweet in a in a Facebook for I know. Uh, I'll do that through LRO. And most people watch this later. It's just more interesting when you can actually... We have one viewer. One person is out there. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Jeff Seltzer, Setzer. I don't know how to actually say your last name, Jeff. I'm sorry. He had to get a second window to get it started. Oh, that's always frustrating. Um, so cool. We have two viewers, two viewers in the audience. I now sound like the Count from Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> Setzer. Okay. Thank you, Jeff, for telling me how to pronounce your name. Um, okay. Cool. So... Everyone pretty much ready to get started? Okay. Um, it's, I'm used to Fraser doing this part. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Season 2 of the CLSE Hangouts. These are hangouts that are all about lunar exploration, understanding our moon, and also the small bodies that well, occupy the inner part of the solar system and hopefully don't careen into us. Uh, this is a production of the Lunar and Planetary Institute in collaboration with CosmoQuest. Uh, I am Dr. Pamela Gay, Director of CosmoQuest, and with me, as always, is Andy Shainer from the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Hey, Andy. Hello, Pamela. This week, we are joined by special guest and longtime collaborator, Andrea Jones. She is the director of the International Observe the Moon Night, which is just around the corner and is here to help us all get excited about celebrating. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. So, so INOM is, is something that not enough people know about. We're trying to make this a big thing. Help us get excited. What, what is INOM in a nutshell? Uh, well, INOM is, is really a celebration. Um, so it's a celebration of lunar science, of planetary science, um, and of our connections with the moon, uh, both personally and culturally, as well as scientifically. So um, I like to ask people, you know, what is your favorite memory of the moon? Like, do you have a memory that the moon features prominently? And, and probably, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, and you probably have an answer to that. Yeah, so, um, so you must have heard some amazing things over the years as you've talked to people. What, what are some of the incredible responses that you've gotten? Oh, well, certainly, you know, lots of Apollo answers. So a lot of people are like, wow, I saw, you know, I saw that, you know, when I was this little kid now, a lot of them um, that I'm working with and, uh, you know, that just strikes somebody forever. Um, and then, you know, a lot of stories with kids like, oh, you know, the, when my kid first realized that, you know, could point out the moon or um, was really confused why the moon followed us home in the car. Um, lots of, you know, moonlit hikes and, and on the walks on the beach. And, you know, there's just soccer games by moonlight and and all kinds of all kinds of things people just have that or you know they're watching the moon rise in the mountains while they're out you know hiking with their family or something like that so everybody I have ever asked that question of has been able to answer it um, and I think that's really fa fabulous that we have this celestial neighbor that features within our lives um, and you know shapes our memories a little bit and and certainly is within our culture we I mean, can you can you think of a song that has the word moon in it can you think of a book <laughs> I think everyone can yes <laughs> can you think of a poem or a painting or you know this is in our culture this is really part of our society and and our history has been shaped by the moon i mean eclipses particularly have you know been involved in in history um so that is an aspect of this and then we bring in from nasa you know the really amazing discoveries that are happening right now um, about the moon so you know I, i've been on here talking about 
these types of things before, but some of, you know, I think the most remarkable recent lunar discoveries are, you know, that the moon is still potentially volcanol, uh, volcanically active. Um, so that's remarkable. We had thought the moon was sort of, you know, this dead, geologically dead place. Um, and, and it might not be like, there might still be cooling going on and, and shrinking may even still be going on. We have evidence that that happened recently. You know, we're finding pits where maybe future astronauts can go. We know the shape of the moon surface better than the shape of the earth or any other object in the solar system. So, I mean, all of these things we want to make sure people find out about them and international observe the moon night is a way to share this with the world and to get people who are excited about these things talking to one another all around the entire world and and this truly is a global event international observe the moon night is is one of the legacy projects that came out of the international year of astronomy back in 2009 and i remember that first celebration i i got to be in in Rome of all the crazy places the following year for that second celebration in 2010 and as as we're watching everything come in we see this excitement of hey this worked we have a bigger audience and that's the moon sinking over the city of Rome over on the western horizon while we're watching people tweet about watching it rise in the Americas. And there's this sense of, of we can take shared experiences and basically hand them off where first I get to watch that crescent moon rise here in Illinois. And then a few hours later, it's happening in other parts of the world as, as the world literally turns. What, what different kinds of cultural tie-ins have you seen over the years? Oh, that's been that's been really fun. Um, so I, I used to be a, a, a national park ranger in Canyonlands pa National Park in Utah, um, and you know, years later, uh, one of the rangers that's there now said, "Hey, I want to do a moon program. Like, can you help me with that?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I can help you with that." Um, so I mean, a lot of native cultures have stories about the moon, you know, as part of uh, as part of their their history, of, as part of you know what they share with. The current generation as well and so that has been something we've seen really tied in um, in terms of cultural things related to the arts something that we're, we're doing right now is the lunar reconnaissance orbiter camera has an exhibit at the national air and space museum um, in washington dc but it's available online there's an interactive exhibit that you can explore all these images um, and i like to think of it as ansel adams for the moon it's just it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's it's remarkably stunning, um, and yet it's scientifically interesting. It's you know this is this is what we are learning about the moon from. This is what is helping us revolutionize our understanding of our nearest neighbor, and yet it's gorgeous. Um, so that's really fun. And then this year also, um, we are about to release a music video about the moon, which is just going to be so much fun. It's called the moon and more. Um, and it features, um, the, the first season winner, I believe of the voice, um, as well as another, you know, fabulous musician. And this is going live next Wednesday, or sorry, next Monday, October 3rd. So those are some sort of modern cultural uh, references to, to incorporate. But we're also at Goddard, we're having librarians come in and they're going to bring their favorite moon books um, to share with visitors. And, um, you know, they're also going to bring some of the technology resources that they have because they, they have assured me that libraries are not just books anymore. And I definitely understand that. Um, but, you know, we, we've had places where we have your best lunar photography or paintings or poetry. I, li I like that too. But yeah, there's just so many different, so many different ways that if, if you respond to it and connect to it, this is a, a place to celebrate that. Now, people, of course, are going to want to find out all the ways that they can celebrate. And, and I know, Andy, you have the pleasure of being the web guru for this project. Um, <laughs> And and I'd love it if you could bring up the, the website that we could start to show people where they can go to, to learn more about all these things that are going on. Well, sure. 
There we go. So this is the the International Observe the Moon site, which is is literally observethemoonnight.org. And and what are some of the highlights of the site? Can you take us through them? Uh, sure. Uh, so, of course, the home place is a good place to begin. Um, the, up at the top, we have a variety of menu options to look at. Uh, we have this, just had this great picture here on the front. This is actually from INOM in 2014. Um, we got this through the um, Flickr, our Flickr group page that somebody submitted from Rhode Island. And I just thought it was a really great picture. So when we opened or unveiled the new website look about a little over a year ago, we put this on the side to put this on the front here. Um, if you keep going, you can click this link here and this will, hopefully this should show up, pops up a, a globe there of uh, the earth. And you can see where all the different locations are where people at least have registered to this point, which as of this morning was something about 370. However, we are not pulling in the night sky network data points yet. So once we get that up, I'm sure that'll, that number will, in, will increase. Uh, so you can zoom it around or if I rotate around, you can, well, it's kind of finicky. You can zoom in on it. Um, yeah, it's got that weird, weird problem there. Sorry. That's a, we have been using Google Earth, which was a much better program, uh, but they stopped supporting that API for this kind of a oh. thing. So we had to go with something called WebGL, and it's just not as nice or fun, but it still does the job. Uh, you can click on this link here, and this will take you to a registration page. Uh, it's where you can put in your information to register your event. Um, so you go here. We have a few kind of pre-evaluation questions, actually, that we like to ask to get some information from people right off the bat, right up front. Um, three of them, that is. And then just your name. And you can tell us whatever you want, whatever you don't want to tell us. Um, these asterisks, um, the, it doesn't mean they're required. It means that if you put something in those fields, they'll show up. Uh, on the map. So uh, I'll show you the map in a second, but let's finish here real quick. Um, we had an issue lately with the URL uh, for some reason. So when people are putting their URL in here, it's showing up in our database, but for some reason, the database wasn't spitting it back out onto our map, but it is now. Uh, so if you had put a URL in there that links to maybe your particular event website for your event, that will now show up. Um, so that's what we're talking about. So if we go up here to get involved, uh, I want to attend an event. This will bring up a Google map, which is, uh, much friendlier to use. Uh, and you can zoom in anywhere. Um, so I know I was just looking at one today, just double check. I know the URL shows up. So if we come here to Bay area and San Francisco, this event, the space station museum here, you see link. If you click that, uh, hyperlink, it'll take you to the page they have on their website about their event. Um, so just want to get that, mention that real quick. But here you can see, uh, pretty well spread out again. Um, I believe the only continent, again, without an event is Antarctica. <laughs> so, uh, so someone down there, get on it. That's right. <laughs> we, we know are that waiting. there's geophysicists down there somewhere. They can <laughs> do it. Um, so now, yeah, no. What's, what's cool about this is, with all those little Twitter things there, this this isn't something where you have to go hang out with a whole bunch of people at telescopes. And if you want to be your own little introvert in the backyard celebrating the moon, you can do that. We, we have a hashtag. Tell it. Tell us a little bit about the social media that you have going on, Andrea. Sure. Yeah. So I think it's really, really important to emphasize this. So thank you, Pamela, that anyone anywhere can host an international Observe the Moon Night event. There is no set agenda. Um, so what we provide on our website are resources that hosts can make use of. And even, you know, a host being my parents have their own event. They, uh, they go out on the porch and they sit out in their lawn chairs and they look at the moon and, you know, that's, that's an event. And, and what they do is, um, well, actually, since they are my parents, I print out for them a moon map um, that we post on our website that shows what the phase of the moon will be on International Observe the Moon Night. So thank you, Andy, for taking us there. Um, 
And then, you know, it, it points out some things that you might want to look for. So we make one of these every year and this shows you exactly what you'll see if you happen to look at the moon on International Observe the Moon Night. And I, we've been using this title for years. It, it always bothers me a little bit because the moon is up just as much during the day as it is at night. And in fact, even on International Observe the Moon Night, it's up during the day. Um, but on this day, this is what the, the illumination of the surface of the moon will look like. And some of the best places to look, should you be looking at the moon, are along that line between day and night, that terminator line. And so we highlight those on our maps and then provide a little bit more information about what you're looking at um, and then on the back of our map we have a little more information about what those features are and then also include hey do you want to find out more these are all lunar reconnaissance orbiter camera images and you can find them all in much you know larger versions and higher even higher resolution um, where you can zoom into the pebbles on the surface really um, and analyze them in even more detail but you can see these you know with your eyes and then if you have telescopes or binoculars or other ways to you know, magnify what you're seeing, it's even more exciting, of course. But the moon is great because everyone can see it, even if you don't have um, any particular aid. So that, that's really important for the event. Anyone, anywhere can host it. People host them in their backyards, like my parents, or you know, science centers with hundreds or even thousands of people participate. So it's whatever you want it to be, whatever resources you have available to you, whatever expertise you have available to you, make it your own and just join us in, in celebrating the moon, but do it in a way that makes sense for you and for your audience. And, and I can see in the comments that Jeff Setzer has gone out and he has already set up an event. Thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us in this. Now, one, one of the things that I personally love about International Observe the Moon Night is, is there's a lot of people out there that don't realize there's still so much we don't know about the moon, that it's still something that we're actively studying, actively learning new things about. And, and it's through a mission that you're working very closely with, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, that we are making these constant new discoveries. What, what's some of the new science that you're really hoping that, that people are going to learn this year as, as they get inspired to go learn about our moon? Well, we just got uh, funded for a new extended mission, um, so that's very exciting, our third extended science mission. Um, LRO is kind of interesting because it started as an exploration mission, so we, we went up to the moon intending to find a spot or a few spots where people could land on the surface and you know have a long-term setup there. Um, so all of our instruments are designed to help find out the areas that are most scientifically interesting and the safest for, for landing and for exploration. Um, and then things changed. Um, so we're not sending people up to the moon right now. But what LRO is doing is preparing for when that time happens. So when it comes, we're going to be ready to go. Um, but in the meantime, we are really focusing on the exciting things about, you know, our, our neighbor that we didn't know before and some things that we're focusing on in the next two years or so um, are some of the changes that are happening on the surface. So again, we didn't really expect to be looking at that, but we're finding, you know, the impact cratering rate in the solar system um, that's really defined by a few moon rocks and a few sites on the surface. Um, and we're trying to monitor over more years now. We've been up there since 2009, but the longer we collect a data set of the, the impacts that are happening now um, and compare it to what we anticipate should be happening, um, we can better constrain the ages of different surfaces on the moon and thereby, you know, the ages of other places that we're dating, you know, using impact craters on, you know, all of the terrestrial planets throughout the inner solar system um, and, and other objects here. So that's pretty fundamental. Um, that's pretty important. Uh, we're also looking at, you know, the water on the moon and how it's maybe even moving. We might be able to track that with our instruments um, from day to night and, you know, throughout the, the month and throughout, you know, a, a year and all of that. So we're, we're tracking that. Um, and also, I'm just going to stop yeah. you for okay. a second on that because when people think about water moving, they think about like you spill a glass of water and it rolls all over the floor, or you might think about glaciers very slowly in their glaciery way, destroying the landscape as they plow across it. But 
when you talk about water moving on the moon, this this is a completely different process where it it's not flowing like a normal liquid. It's actually going through a very complex cycle of sublimation and freezing that, that maybe you can talk about real fast. Yeah, and so I should also back up and say that we are not talking about Niagara Falls. Um, we're not talking about glaciers of any kind. Um, we are talking about a, a landscape that is drier than the driest desert that we have here on Earth. So we're talking about very small amounts of water, but the fact that there is any water is a pretty remarkable thing to find out, especially in a place that has what we call a surface boundary exosphere, but that basically means it doesn't have an appreciable atmosphere. It's very, very tenuous, very thin, and yet the moon is able to retain some, um, some gas envelope around it. Um, even if the particles don't interact, it's still there. Um, but that there's water on this kind of body is amazing. Um, so the places that we find it the most are in places that we call the permanently shadowed regions of the poles of the moon. So the moon is only tilted a very tiny little bit on its axis um, in terms of how it rotates compared to the ecliptic. So most of the time it's it's basically up and down. And so if you dig a giant hole in one of these areas of the poles um, by, you know, forming an impact crater, then that bowl that results um, can actually, that bottom of the bowl can be shielded from any sunlight for billions of years. So that's a really, really, really cold spot. Those are the places that we have found the coldest measured places in the entire solar system. So that's a trap. Um, so water is, is held there for a long time, but then the one, the water that's moving, um, yeah, thank you. So yeah, so we have some some places and here's a neutron flux map. And so this is actually mapping a, a place where the water is likely to be. So this is a process where our neutron detector um, can detect neutrons coming off of the surface of the moon and actually elsewhere too, but off of the surface of the moon and where you see a depression in the number of neutrons coming off the moon, there is an increased um, presence of hydrogen and hydrogen is highly associated with water. So there's a few steps away, but it's, it's a pretty strong, like, um, founded correlation. Um, and so those places where you see, you know, a lower neutron flux. So uh, the purple and pink places for those yes. who can't read the numbers on YouTube, because we know this resolution isn't that great. So purple exactly. and pink is what we're worried about. The purples and the dark blues and the blacks even, those places, um, especially concentrated towards the poles, have the most, uh, the least amount of neutrons coming off the surface uh, indicating a higher presence of, of hydrogen in those areas and therefore a higher uh, presence of uh, water in, in the form of water ice. So that's not the migration that we're really talking about. We're talking about even, um, you know, like a, it has been referred to as a moon dew. And that has also been a term that some scientists are horrified about because it's a moon dew like on the order of microns or atoms even it's not it's not like you know you walk outside and you're going to be wet on your on your moon boots it's you wouldn't even notice um but those atoms can move around they can bounce around um so as you know they're illuminated by the sun they get energized and then they can hop around and that hopping around we might be able to track with things like lamp one of our other instruments um, which we have just changed how we're going to detect um, things with that instrument and have a 80 times the resolution that we have had all missions so far so it should be pretty exciting for day side observations so, so this is really amazing science, and it actually ties in really nicely with one of our, our viewers commented, Camp Bayou commented, uh, that they're having a moonlight paddle on their river for, for International Observe the Moon Night. Fabulous. So, so discussing the, the uh, kind of sort of, it's actually there, but not much, water on the moon while paddling through a river sounds like a really awesome thing to be doing and I feel and, like that goes back to the what's your favorite memory of the moon I feel like good memories can be made while paddling on a moonlit river excellent that sounds good 
And and I know another one of those memories that that a lot of people have. It's it's one of the strong ones for me, is is going outside, looking up, and seeing that beautiful amber moon on the horizon, where the atmosphere is knocking out a lot of the blues, leaving us with this orangey, gorgeous moon. But then once the moon's high in the sky, our eyeballs perceive it as shades of gray. But but LRO recently put out, and I'm going to go ahead and screen share this. Um, an amazing picture of an area on the moon that is, um, this is real color. This is, is a section of the moon where we're seeing um, essentially reddish spots in the La Selle Massif area, which this is lava flows. And one of the pieces of science that you brought up, Andrea, is is that we're now starting to think that our, our nearby completely dead moon isn't dead after all. And some of these volcanoes, well, and maybe future ones, might still have a little bit more to spit out. Yeah, we, we have not seen any active volcanoes on the moon. Um, we have not seen any, um, any of the, the faults that indicate the moon is shrinking be active. But it's possible. I mean, we're finding evidence of these features having been active in the past few million years. And I'm a geologist. And so to me, that's like nothing. And, and Pamela, you even deal with longer timescales than me. So like you haven't even finished blinking in the timescales that we're talking about. Um, so it's really remarkable and exciting to, to be thinking about this kind of activity potentially going on. And, and yeah, I really like thinking about the colors of the moon. And certainly it's, it's pretty gray, but not completely. It's got some, it's got some character. <laughs> and, and I just love the, this idea of the volcanism because we're, we're so used to seeing this, this nearby orbiting rock in our sky, big rock. But there was a time when had early algaes had advanced eyeballs and telescopes, they could have seen active lava flows on the moon. And, and this is just something that it's very hard for us to imagine today to, to see the moon mountains as, as being the same sorts of volcanoes that are in Hawaii, basically, from what I understand. Um, well, so we do definitely, we, we go to places like Hawaii and Craters of the Moon uh, National Monument and New Mexico uh, with the volcanic fields out there to better understand volcanic processes acting here and then try to better understand how they may compare with places like volcanism on the moon and Mars and other objects too. Um, we're not really talking about the huge shield volcanoes that make up the entire island of Hawaii, um, that kind of um, that kind of volcanism yeah. is is not the, really the long term hot spot is not on the moon. It's, right. it's more the the structure of the. Yeah, like the individual flows yes. are very similar to what we're finding. And even um, that's really a good analog for um, impact crater melt because impact crater melt is essentially, well, it is melted molten rock that's moving um, in some instances. And that, you know, that's what lava is too. And so we can study both, um, you know, impact melt and volcanoes on the moon by studying some of the lava fo flows around the world. And, and if you need barbecue ideas, there was a poster last year at the American Geophysical Union meeting where they showed people who study lava creating artificial lava to measure cooling times. And they had their lava flowing underneath a grill that their lunch was barbecuing upon. <laughs> so Yeah. Yeah, actually. And I, I work with one of the teams um, that is uh, creating uh, molten rock that's simulating lava flows. Uh, and the scientist there, uh, I was out with her in Craters of the Moon this summer, and we were talking about, you know, how does, how does the, the process of, of, you know, the spatter cones uh, work, for example, and, and how do the different rocks cool? Is it from the inside out? And what, how do the gases migrate throughout the rock, you know, as it's cooling? Um, and so we were, we were discussing this, and she said, well, 
I think what we're going to do when we do our next experiment this fall is add pop rocks to it. So they're going to, you know, make molten rocks and then throw pop rocks in to simulate um, gas bubbles because when they heat up the rocks, it's not in the same um, time scale that you would do it in nature. They, they co co um, heat them up really fast and all the gases escape so they can't make bubbles. So she's like, all right, on with the pop rocks. So <laughs> they're going to throw in, you know, the strawberry, the cherry, the grape and throw it in there and make the, the bubbles and then see what happens. So, science with pop rocks. <laughs> and, and should you wish to use one of our educational activities from CosmoQuest to learn about cratering processes, we actually have a standard NASA activity. You take flour, sprinkle a layer of cocoa on top of it to, to simulate the darker stuff on the surface and the lighter stuff underneath. And then we tend to use gumdrops, drop them in from a variety of heights. They create craters of a variety of sizes. Use toothpicks to pull them out. Now in nature, the transition from kinetic energy to, well, explosion forming crater completely destroys the asteroid, but you have to give the gumballs some help and remove them with toothpicks. But uh, edible science is always a good thing. There's also some Oreo cookie phases in the moon activities that you can do. And um, yeah, let's mix our pop rocks in to, to simulate those volatiles. And clearly I haven't had dinner yet. <laughs> so, so I see um, more people in the comments. Mark Hayes is, is pointing out that this time of season, this time of year, the the harvest season, we end up with this beautiful reddish orange moon as it rises. Now, how much of of the harvest moon red is is due to seasonal variations in the atmosphere? I don't know if you know the answer to this. Um, versus, um, just we we all have pumpkin spice on the brain. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, and um, I'm. So certainly interaction with the um, atmosphere is the, the primary reason um, for, you know, the appearance of the moon um, being a, a different color. And I'm trying to think, um, Gordon Johnston at, at NASA headquarters put out something about the harvest moon and the color of it, and I'm trying to think of what was all of that about. Um, okay, so, yeah, it, it it's... I think it's mostly just from when it's rising and the interaction with the atmosphere. Um, but that's a great question, and I'm going to look that up and, and find out, and I will get back to Pamela on that, because um, I'm now curious to see if I know the full answer. So great question. Um, I think it's not something that doesn't happen other times, but I would like to be sure, so I'm going to say but, I don't know, and, and, also, and we'll look into it. There's also weird... Uh, regional differences. So for instance, if a giant volcano goes off, everything is redder on the horizon. You end up with much redder sunsets. You end up with much redder moonrises. Uh, around here, it's harvest time, which means our atmosphere is completely clogged with corn smut and corn particles and soybean particles and soybean beetles. I don't think soybean beetles necessarily scatter light, but the atmosphere is filled with them. Um, and, and having all of that particulate matter in the atmosphere, which gets tossed up by all those big old John Deere tractors getting us our food for the next year, um, around here at least, does affect the horizon colors. And, and so I think a lot of it depends on where you are, if a volcano's gone off, or if you're somewhere that's just a nice, beautiful tropical island devoid of corn smut. Yeah, and, and I also don't know if it has anything to do with, um, you know, the amount of atmosphere we're looking through to see the moon based on, you know, seasonal variations. And yeah, like that. so I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And people, people say that, but I do, I do think, if I'm remembering correctly, that I have seen, you know, that that pumpkin moon in the sky you know, whenever it's near the horizon, and certainly, like, you can't, it does look more orangey, reddish, because what you're doing is you're looking through the atmosphere, just like, you know, there's sunrise and sunset all the time, you get those beautiful colors. It's, it's the same process. It's just you're looking through a longer wavelength of light. 
or sorry, the, the longer wavelengths of light can make it through and therefore we can see them and see that color while the other ones get scattered. And so I suspect we just are paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's a fabulous video on Vimeo that I'm going to try and screen share that actually shows this beautifully. And let me make sure that I also have all of the credit information in here. It's called Full Moon Silhouettes by Mark Gee. And this video um, captures all the atmospheric noise that is part of Moonrise. And you can get photos like this through a basically 300 millimeter lens or bigger. Um, so you go off at a great distance where you can just discern the people on the horizon and your field of view is roughly a degree or so across. So you need a big lens. And as the moon rises, you can see this different color. You can see the atmospheric noise affecting how the light gets bent. And when I say atmospheric noise, I'm talking about how the atmosphere has different temperatures in it. And these different temperatures cause the light to bend in different ways. Just like when you try and look along the highway in the summer, you see the air shimmering. Uh, this is just the atmosphere shimmering from all the different temperature pockets in it and so here's the the moon rising in real time off in the distance in that beautiful golden color so so while this this is is playing so andrea what what was your favorite moon experience before becoming a a, a geoscientist <laughs> um well, I, I used to uh, work at a science education camp out in California, and uh, one of my jobs was to show the kids that came up from inner city LA who had many of them never been you know outside of the city at all before, uh, different objects in the sky through a telescope. Um, and there are lots of remarkable things to look at through a telescope, but as many things as I've seen, my favorite remains the moon. Because, you know, looking at, at Saturn is, of course, gorgeous, and looking at all these other places are great. But I feel like when you look through the moon, or sorry, look through a telescope at the moon, you can really see a landscape. You can see a world. You can almost imagine hiking those mountains and you know, strapping on a pair of skis and, and going down, uh, down into the valleys. And, you know, I, I really feel like I can picture myself in this other world in a way that I don't necessarily get from a telescope um, at, at some of the other objects I've seen. Um, and so I really, really like that. And I got to share that with, you know, fourth through sixth graders who had never looked through a telescope before and just their reaction to, oh my gosh, you know, I can't believe that's real, and this, and where's this sticker? Like, they totally didn't believe that what we were showing them was actual landscape and actual territory and actual, you know, clusters of stars and things like that. But that was, that was one of my, my pre, uh, pre-geology, you know, degree <laughs> favorites. So, so what about you, Andy? What was your favorite lunar memory? Oh, geez. I don't have a favorite. Um, I don't know. I guess it was when I was in grad school down in Tucson at the University of Arizona. One evening I saw them, I saw the moon rising up over the Catalina Mountains. <clears throat> and uh, it was weird because I just, I saw it just coming up. And so I just sat there and stared at it um, and watched it come up. And when I just started to clear the tops of the mountains, it looked you know, obviously this optical illusion, but it looked like the bottom of the moon was just kind of hanging on and that stretched a little bit um, up against the mountains. Uh, then, of course, it completely cleared it and looked around again. But I swear it really looked like the moon, like it was just really stretching out at the bottom. And, and if you want to figure out what is the alignment that lets you see the moon rising behind the mountains like like Andy saw or to to capture photos like um, or, or videos like I just showed you from uh, Mark Gee 
Jim Hendrickson is pointing out in the comments um, that you can go to a website called The Photographer's Ephemeris to learn when and where to get these types of moonrise, moonset alignments. And there's a lot of really good photos that people have taken over at the World at Night website. Uh, and, and there are people who essentially design their travel plans so that they can be in the right place at the right time to catch the moon rising behind all sorts of amazing historical uh, statues, buildings, everything. It's, it's gorgeous. So go explore. And if you're having a cloudy night on International Observe the Moon Night, we have the internet. <laughs> so so share share all of these things and be prepared to show not just your favorite story, but also your favorite, well, online thing um, of the moon. And those crater counts that, that Andrea was talking about earlier, we still don't have a good, solid, small-scale map of the moon. We know where the big stuff is. We can see that. It's easy. But the smaller stuff that's going to be a hazard to the Google Lunar Xbot robots and to just like your everyday dude trying to get from point A to point B, Mark Watney style on the moon, hopefully with better life support and food, um, they're going to need high quality maps. We're working to produce these for scientific use through CosmoQuest. So if you're having a cloudy night or if you're just cold and want to go inside, um, go over to CosmoQuest.org and help us do science, help us map out the moon. Um, quick link to the moon is just CosmoQuest.org slash moon, and that gets you to moon mappers. So, so what are each of you going to be doing on International Observe the Moon Night? Andy, I'm going to go to you first. Okay. Uh, well, we'll have an event here at LPI. Uh, from 7 to 9 in the evening. Hopefully it's actually clear and we can look at the moon. Um, we'll have some hands-on activities, a couple of presentations from one of our scientists about the moon. And one thing I also mentioned, for those of you that like anniversaries, uh, 2016 is the 50th anniversary of the Lunar Orbiter Program. So back in 1966, the first uh, in 67, NASA launched five spacecraft to orbit the moon, images the surface close up. And those images were then used to select the Apollo landing sites. So 50 years ago this time, we were doing the same thing LRO is doing, but with better technology <laughs> than what we had 50 years ago. So we'll actually have a, we're going to take those six images that are on the back of the moon map, and we're going to have, we're going to put on display uh, six images, original prints from Lunar Orbiter, uh, lunar orbiter missions that contain those six Im those those six features that we see on the moon map. So we'll be able to tie those lunar orbiter images in with the recent LRO images. And you should post that to the INOM website so everyone can see it, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> and and I have to admit, I'm probably going to be playing online because that's where I like to be. Uh, we're working on doing a bunch of massive updates to CosmoQuest, and we're hoping to push a lot of those live in time for International Observe the Moon Night. And I'll be online watching everything on Twitter and making sure everything goes right for those of you mapping things at CosmoQuest. So join us and get some science in. Now, this was our first episode of the second season of the CLSE Hangouts, and we have more science to bring you once a month. Well, until we run out of, of science, which is never going to happen, or until our grant ends, which will eventually happen, and, and then we'll figure out other ways to keep going because science. Um, so, so can you give us some ideas of some of the things that we're likely going to talk about in the coming months, Sandy? Sure. Next month, uh, we'll actually hear from some high school students who are part of one of our programs here at LPI, uh, well, CLSC. Uh, that were a part of our high school research program. But they, we sent them to the uh, survey uh, conference meeting out at uh, Ames this summer. So they'll talk about their experience in the program and the research they did and their experience out at this meeting at Ames. Uh, in November, we'll hear from uh, Addie Dove at the University of Central Florida. Uh, she actually does studies on that dust, that stuff that can gunk up uh, space suit and spacecraft parts on the moon and other uh, small bodies. Uh, so she'll be, uh, we'll be chatting with her in November. That all sounds fabulous, and I look forward to 
all of these conversations to come. So everyone give us a subscription click over on YouTube and this will turn on alerts when we have shows ready to go and you'll never miss an episode. So thank you everyone for tuning in this evening. Thank you, Andrea, for taking time out of your evening to, to talk to us about INOM. Thank you, Andy, as always, for being with me for, for this event. And all of you in the audience, Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing your information. And uh, let's go out and explore the moon. I'll talk to you all next time. Have a great morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you may be in the world.